So let's start with part two and understand the spiritual conquest. Now, coupled with the military and material conquest of central Mexico is the spiritual conquest. Now, like Castilian society as a whole, the church is, a very, is also a part of the crusading uh, 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 adventure, um, especially after Spain had experienced 300 years of reconquering, uh, uh, the, 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 reconquering the land from the Moors, from the Muslims. So this is known as the Reconquista. So the church was a, a crusading institution. And the prospect of, of mass conversions for the church, of course, is very exciting to the Pope. So all, all kinds of orders are going to be uh, uh, moved towards the Western Hemisphere uh, in, in the expansion. As much as there was a material, material expansion, there is the expansion of the church itself. So all kinds of orders are going to uh, benefit from this particular expansion. Franciscans, Dominicans, Augustinians. Basically, as one historian said, they were the shock troops of the <clears throat> spiritual conquest. Because they preached, they converted, they baptized, they built, they educated, they wrote, they researched, they administered. So that by 1560, they perhaps numbered 1,000. They established by 1560 in a 40-year period, 160 convents. Now, the Franciscans are the ones that are going to be important for us, Franciscans, uh, first Jesuits and then Franciscans, because they dominated the center, the west, and the northwest, while the Dominicans dominated Central America and the south. Now, the densest concentration of, of missions at the very beginning is going to be in the heartland, in the Valley of Mexico. So when you go into the Valley of Mexico, you'll see missions everywhere, churches established everywhere. Franciscans often gained a, a brutal reputation, sometimes using the sword, the stocks, and the whip to join souls for Christ, whereas Dominicans preferred a gradual, cautious strategy of conversion. Now, one of the things that's most important is to recognize that the church uh, is likewise involved in transforming native peoples. And one of the things that the church is going to do is they're going to transform native peoples into Spanish-speaking workers for the material conquest. So the church is working hand in glove with the material conquest. Material conquest can't work without the spiritual conquest. Now, the church will do whatever it can to also participate in that process of assimilation, negotiation, and, of course, eliminating resistance. So the church is very important in, in, in trying to transform native societies, and it becomes a very important cog in the wheel of conquest and colonialism in creating settler societies, settler states. So let's go to a film clip and let's see what happened to the Mayan as the church moves in and destroys their history. Spanish arrived on the shores of the Yucatan Peninsula in 1517. Every large cosmopolitan center of the Maya world had been abandoned. Even so, a splintered Maya civilization, living in small villages across the countryside, put up a sustained fight against the conquistadors. They proved difficult to conquer because rather than taking a king captive or an emperor, as they did with the Aztec, they had to conquer one village at a time. And once they'd moved on to the next village, there'd be one behind them that would then uh, begin to rise in revolt. Maya warriors killed conquistadors by the thousands, but their weapons proved useless against a more potent enemy, disease. Within 100 years, 90% of the population of the New World was gone. The Maya who survived faced further persecution. Friar Diego de Landa, had been sent from Spain to convert the Maya to Christianity, and he ruthlessly enforced his religious teachings. Diego de Landa was a young idealist who came to the New World trying to save souls, trying to win converts to what he referred to as the one true faith. But the Maya didn't believe that they should instantly and forevermore reject all of their own beliefs. On July 12, 1562, 
Landa ordered an auto de fe, or burning of the Maya texts, believing they were the writing of the devil. This was the end of thousands of years of accumulated knowledge of Maya civilization, one of the great tragedies in human history. In a lucky twist of fate, four codices survived the inferno and wear and terror of time. By the 19th century, some of these books that happened to escape the clutches of these friars and their destructive urges began to make their way into public attention. Today, their survival story is just another mystery in the complex history of the Maya. The fact that they were able to sustain an urban civilization in the rainforest for 1,500 years through all sorts of logistical and, and other challenges is one that we should admire and one from which we can stand to learn a great deal. Just as the Maya looked from the ground to the sky for guidance, we are now looking from the sky to the ground for answers. In recent years, NASA and the University of New Hampshire have been experimenting with remote sensing technology to see if they can determine where undiscovered cities might be hidden. Mounds of earth covered in trees that appear on readings may actually be ruins of ancient cities that have not been touched for centuries. More answers to the Maya mysteries may be right beneath our feet. My archaeology is just beginning. There are innumerable cities, innumerable temples, innumerable settlements that we have not been able to study and excavate. I think we're entering the golden age of my archaeology, and I can only see in the next century a time in which this will become one of the best understood civilizations of the ancient world. We now know that the Maya were an innovative and creative and majestic people with their own particular taste for violence. But what is the real allure of the Maya? What is this mystique that draws generation after generation the world over to this complex and sophisticated civilization? Is it the architecture with its serene palaces and temples or the intricacies of hieroglyphs and art in a complex writing system? Or is it the astounding comprehension of astronomy and mathematics with the concept of zero unparalleled in antiquity? Or is it simply because these remarkable people carved entire cities, not just villages and towns, but magnificent cities right out of some of the most inhospitable landscape in the entire world? In the rainforest between Honduras and the Yucatan, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of Maya sites that are untouched. In Palenque alone, there are 1,500 buildings that lie unexcavated, including temples larger than that one. And if you consider the archaeological treasures yet to be found in cities like Tikal and Chichen Itza, I say, and I'm sure I'm not alone, that the real allure of the Maya the real magic and mystique of this civilization are the mysteries that still lie buried deep within this jungle. I'm Peter Weller for the History Channel. All right, Peter Weller for the History Channel. Now, isn't that amazing? I mean, it's the allure of the Mayans. You know, the whole idea, and we have to understand about, uh, about historical artifacts and the archives. <clears throat> what Diego de Landa understood is, is you need to destroy you need to rob, you need to loot the archives. Because when you take away the history, then you take away the identity of the population. New histories have to be written favoring the conquerors. So historical revision introduces us to the prejudices, creating a distinction between us and them. And now I want to address this because what the film talks about, even though it's saying all of this greatness of the Mayans, well, guess what? Uh, and, and despite all of the talk of decimation, despite all of the talk of annihilation, despite all of the talk of 90% of the population was disappeared. Yes, Native peoples had to deal with this annihilation and decimation, but you know what? We're still around. We haven't left. And the Mayans, the Mayans are still from Honduras all the way into the Yucatan. But we need to understand, well, again, the significance of the conquest, the significance of creating colonial settler societies and eliminating those who are already here. Because then all of a sudden it's just like, for instance, you get all of these films 
that they go and fascinate, they're fascinating. The Mayans were fascinating way back then. But what about the Mayans right now? What about all those children that are on the border right now trying to find some kind of escape from all the violence that the United States has been created in Central America that causes them to come up north? What's going on along the border right now with this administration that is separating children from their families? That's the Mayan. Those are Mayan peoples. They're, the, they're, they're still around. We're still here. We have not left. So welcome to the Chicano experience. Again, <clears throat> again, like I shared with you, historical revision introduces the prejudices, and the prejudices continue into this day, even with films like this. They're fascinating, but you have to understand the underlying feature here. Peter Weller might be amazed at the Mayans, but what about the Mayans today? Where, where are the Mayans today? What's happening to them? And this is very important because <clears throat> there's many, many Spanish spiritual leaders who were involved in the exploitation of native peoples, and they served very important political roles. And so there's names like Franciscan Juan de Zumarraga. He was the first bishop of Mexico, and the guy was, uh, supervised large concentrations of native labor forces. He was most ruthless. Um, we're going to run into a Dominican friar named uh, Bartolomeo de las Casas, and there's another uh, uh, Franciscan named Toribio de Benevente, which is known as Motolonia, which means poor in Nahuatl. Um, you, you do get a priest who kind of, kind of come to a revelation saying that this is not right, and they became defenders of native rights. Um, in fact, Bartolomeo de las Casas um, uh, is going to uh, advocate for native rights once he realizes what he's doing, uh, what, what he's committing in this, in, in this uh, thing called genocide, because he's a participant in it. And he's going to realize that he needs to go to before the Pope and tell the Pope that native peoples are human beings. You can't just go and massacre them and murder them, that they are actually human. Now we're going to go to a film clip from another documentary entitled Christianity, the second thousand years. We're going to uh, appreciate that the role Christianity played in enslaving native peoples first and then Africans. And in the middle, you're going to en encounter, we're going to encounter uh, 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 Father Bartolomeo de las Casas. But let's appreciate, and again, let's understand again the conquest of Mexico, the conquest of the Caribbean. It's a turn point for two reasons. One is the Reformation, and the other is the tremendous expansion that takes place at that time. The printing press had helped fuel the Protestant Reformation within Europe. Now another innovation will take Christianity beyond Europe's shores. Nimble, three-masted Portuguese sailing ships will enable travelers to go where they've never gone before, to unknown ends and new worlds. It is the age of exploration. For the first time in their history, Europeans sail the world. And wherever they go, whatever they explore, they bring with them the faith of Europe, Christianity. Africa. Asia, the Americas. In little more than 150 years, Western Europeans more than triple the size of their Christian realm. However, Christian explorers bring more than just their faith. They also bring a profound sense of cultural superiority and a lust for wealth. And so it is that Spanish conquistadors arrive in the New World. Often ruthless and brutal, their actions lead to the decimation of entire native cultures. The Spanish conquest of the, of the Western Hemisphere shows some of the worst depth to which Christianity can lower itself. The, the atrocities that were committed in the name of Christianity which were enormous, and there's no way to deny those. 
These ancient structures in central Mexico are all that remain today of a once mighty civilization called the Aztecs. Nearly five centuries ago, the Aztecs came face to face with cruel destiny in the man who would destroy them, a Spaniard named Hernán Cortés. Like many of his fellow conquistadors, Cortés is a devout Christian. He prays faithfully, attends mass, and wells up with tears when confessing his sins. He was a very sincere Christian who also was a thief and a murderer and who thought he was doing that in the service of God. Cortes heads straight to Tenochtitlan, capital city of the Aztecs. Those natives who do not die from imported European disease succumb to Spanish swords. It is the beginning of European colonies that convert and enslave the indigenous people and the end of Aztec civilization. The conquerors of this new world establish an institution that will be a fierce battleground in Christianity for centuries to come, slavery. In the 16th century, slavery which had dated back to ancient times, is still a common practice in many European countries, particularly in Portugal and Spain. Unknown in the New World, the Spanish conquistadors now make it practically universal. Almost all Europeans in the New World enslave natives, but occasionally a voice is raised in protest. Foremost among them is a Dominican friar named Bartolome de las Casas. When de las Casas sails for the New World in the early 16th century, he witnesses natives being worked to death, or branded, roasted, and eaten by dogs. The situation leaves the friar appalled. Everything done to the Indians thus far was unjust and tyrannical. Bartolome de las Casas, 1514. Bartolome de las Casas uh, was a man who himself had had Indians given to him to work for him, and who then became convinced that this was wrong, and he let go of his Indians, and he spent the whole rest of his life trying to get things changed. De Las Casas proposes an alternative to enslaving the natives. To bring in needed labor, he recommends importing slaves from the continent the Portuguese first explored, Africa. For the Europeans, slaves from Africa do not pose the same moral problem as native slaves in the New World. This, they rationalize, because Africans have supposedly been captured in defensive, or just, wars between tribes. A just war is one in, in which the war takes place, uh, you know, again, for good, for good reason, to defend oneself and one's society against uh, unprovoked attack from others. But now, eventually, you begin to have people, including Las Casas, say, wait a minute, there's so many of these people, could they all be captured in, in just war? And, of course, the answer that uh, is supported by the economics of it is, well, of course they're captured in just war. African slaves begin to flood into the New World, first in the thousands, then tens of thousands, and ultimately millions. The churches of Spain, Portugal, France, England, and the American colonies look on silently as the traffic in African slaves grows. Bartolome de las Casas, who first proposed the idea, lives to regret suggesting importing African slaves 
seeing it as a horrible mistake. He now recommits himself to banning all slavery in the New World. Despite remarkable legal success in Spain, the laws prove unenforceable across the Atlantic. With the passage of time, African slaves and natives in the New World absorb the faith of Christianity and give it new forms of expression that resonate throughout the world, even back to Rome itself. But with time comes change, and with change, uncertainty, and with uncertainty. Let's appreciate something about church historian Justo Gonzalez, what he's talking about. In terms of the atrocities that were committed by the church, there's no way to deny them. The atrocities were there. What Columbus initiated and what the Spanish will do, uh, everyone else are, is going to replicate. The British, the French, the Dutch, all in their attitudes towards native peoples and then their attitudes towards Africans. So black, the black beans and the red beans are going to face the racialization process from the white beans. Uh, I liked what Justo Gonzalez uh, was sharing, the, the church historian, what he was sharing about Cortez, and especially the way that he, that he described him. As he was a very sincere Christian who was also a thief and a murderer. So let's understand and appreciate something about the, the priests because the priests are also going to be the ones that are going to be writing historical and anthropological studies of native societies. Andres de Olmos, uh, uh, Bernardino de Sahagún, um, and Ramírez de Fuenlial, who became the president of the Second Audencia, as they will be interpreting and re historically revising native experiences. But the native peoples are, are, are as the last part of that um, a film clip shares on Christianity is that native peoples and Africans are going to absorb Christianity and they're going to give it new flavor because they are going to balance the demands of the outside world with their rich heritage to create a very unique experience with the church. Uh, in the eyes of the friars, native peoples are, are spiritual children. This is the attitude that they take towards native societies is that, oh, they're just kids, they're infants, they're like um, very meek and docile and we need to help them out. They were seen as special wards. They were looked upon as meek, docile, they were looked up, they're, they're industrious, but yet they're innocent. And of course, when we un understand uh, uh, Bartolomé de las Casas, he had their best interest simply because he was vested in their spirituality and they are going to be treated most brutally because they are not going to be considered human beings them and africans but as native peoples uh, native peoples are going to understand certain things about uh, uh spirituality they are, they are truly spiritual peoples as i was sharing with you in the rich heritage especially with regards to their nature ethics and their environmental religions you know, their nature, ethics, and environmental religions become very important here as Christianity is going to be introduced. Because Franciscan simplicity, the simplicity of most of the, um, <clears throat> uh, of, of the different uh, uh, sects of, of, of Catholicism, the Franciscans and the Jesuits, especially the Franciscans' uh, adoption of poverty, Basically, uh, the corporal works of mercy, and I don't know if you guys understand what the corporal works of mercy are in Christianity. Uh, most of you probably don't understand it because you've been getting the Republican version of the Sermon on the Amount, because Jesus Christ has been portrayed here in the United States as some kind of capitalist. But Jesus Christ is a socialist, he's a communist. Why? Because Jesus Christ talks about feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give drink to the thirsty shelter the homeless. These are known as the corporal works of mercy, not the Sermon on the Amount. Because the Sermon on the Mount talks about let's help peoples, let's help them, let's help them survive as human beings. And when you do that, you get the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit. 
But most people's religions today in Christianity in the United States don't address those issues. So the native peoples understood the corporal works of mercy. In fact, native peoples understand Christianity more than the Christians coming in to give them Christianity. And that's why native peoples are going to adjust and adapt their rich traditions with Jesus Christ. For instance, let me give you an example. There is this one woman in native society in Mexico, central Mexico, and she's known as Tonantzin. She is Mother Earth. There was a temple that was built in a hill just outside of Tochimilco um, for Tonantzin. And so what's going to happen is that Tonantzin is going to be equated with the Virgin Mary. We're going to get one of the most important symbols of native understanding of Christianity through the Virgen de Guadalupe. The Virgen de Guadalupe, she is not a European woman. She is not white. She is native. And the Virgen de Guadalupe is that uh, amalgamation and syncretization, as you're going to be reading in the textbook, the syncretic culture that's going to be created out of this uh, 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 conquest. Because native peoples, one of the most important things about acute disillusionment that robs life of its meaning is that you have to look from within by which to say, hey, you know what? Um, we are proud of who we are. And so here you have a very, very familiar familiar uh, uh, symbol in Mexican iconography, in the Chicano experience, and that's the Virgen de Guadalupe. And everybody knows the Virgen de Guadalupe. She is a native experience. She is unique. It's not a European experience. It's a native experience. And the Virgen today, what is the Virgen all about? It is about the search for economic justice, the search for social justice. It's the search for justice. So here we have a very important part of what uh, the last statement in that film clip about was that they gave the church a new flavor. They provided the church with a new orientation, both African and native. Uh, Quetzalcoatl was equated with St. Thomas, just to give you some other examples. And Cosijo was equated with St. Peter. Um, the Basilica of Guadalupe, Guadalupe, uh, the Virgen de Guadalupe, the Basilica of Guadalupe was built on the sacred hill of Tonantzin. Now, native peoples throughout, and we're going to be learning in this class, the native peoples throughout are going to be building churches, just like the missions that you see around here in California or, or in Arizona or in New Mexico or Texas. Um, native peoples will build churches throughout the Western Hemisphere, and just as easily they will burn them in an instant when priests or the friars became overzealous and oppressive. So every church has a history of being built and being burnt and being rebuilt. Now Franciscans are ultimately going to come into conflict with those who are involved in the material aspect, the Spanish elite. In fact, they will describe the Spanish elite with contempt. The Franciscans are going to come around and challenge the Spanish elite, because the Spanish elite, according to them, they were money-grubbing, wine-bibbing, and horse-riding ways. The materialism of the Spanish elite just interfered with the conversion process. So a movement to end the encomienda was initiated by the church. Actually, it was initiated by the Franciscans. This was a movement to end the exploitation of labor. And it was aided by the onslaught of epidemic diseases. In 1519, smallpox disease uh, uh, that decimated Mexico City. This was deliberately done by Cortez. Uh, he was, uh, it was called biological warfare, eliminate the population through disease. The other, there was another epidemic, uh, was called uh, Cocolitzli in Nahuatl between 1545 and 1548, devastated the population. And then there was another epidemic in 1576 and 77. It was known as Matlazahuatl. So the crown is going to introduce a new form of coerced labor. They're going to change it and they're going to call it repartimiento. Repartimiento. No longer could Spanish landowners inherit native workers through the encomienda. The idea was to get rid of the encomienda because the encomienda proved to be uh, totally corrupt. 
But it doesn't mean that it was over with. It's just that wherever the Franciscans were, they were able to impart repartimiento, what meant, meant that you repart workers. Personal service was suppressed. Tributary rights were confined to goods, cash, and basic foodstuffs, and labor is going to be placed under royal control via the repartimiento. So now you had to go and petition specifically what you wanted to use native labor forces for in the material conquest. All right. So <clears throat> that's the spiritual conquest. We're going to go back to the movie The Mission, and we're going to witness a debate over humanity. And this is what made The Mission uh, such an uh, important film in the 1980s because the debate was that Brazil was moving in and expanding into the Amazonian region and committing genocide as it still continues to do against native populations so that cattle production can continue and the felling of the rainforest continues. So in the 1980s the felling of the rainforest was in earnest just like today the felling of the rainforest continues and for what? For what? For hamburger because on every corner of every market is hamburger. That's the cheapest way to feed massive amounts of populations throughout the world. So the cattle industry is just taking over uh, and causing tremendous climate change. Okay. So let's appreciate uh, back in the 1980s this particular film, The Mission, was designed to enhance the awareness of people's uh, 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 of what was happening in the Amazon and they went to the, the Guarani, that's what's so awesome is that the Guarani, they don't need costume design. They're, they are, uh, 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 they were approached because they were being decimated. Uh, they were losing their land base. Uh, it's, today's modern film, I guess, that matches that is Avatar. Because Avatar was another means by which Hollywood could at least show what's still going on in the Amazon. But uh, people's appetite for hamburger is just continuous. And I, I'm guilty of that because I like, I like hamburgers. I like uh, especially In-N-Out burgers, but uh, you know, that's my, I have to transform myself um, with regards to my own consumption. It's leading to climate change because animal uh, cattle is, is producing uh, climate change, is creating climate change. But um, let's appreciate something with regards, let's go back to this movie and let's witness a debate over humanity. Uh, only the debate pits the Jesuits against Spanish slave raiders who are assisting Portuguese expansion. So let me just catch you up to what's happening because this is a debate that was occurring between Brazil and the Spanish Empire, between Portugal and the Spanish Empire because they have to carve out a boundary and if you take a look at today's boundary between Brazil and Venezuela and Colombia and Ecuador and, uh, and then uh, Paraguay or Uruguay all the way down, that, they're negotiating that border at this time and that's what the the mission is all about. Um, there's a land, a, a border, uh, I, I think it's between Ecuador or, or, or Venezuela and, and Brazil. And so uh, the Portuguese and the uh, uh, Spanish are involved in trying to settle where the border is going to be. And so the church is caught in the middle. Uh, where are they going to build the missions? And so, of course, Slavery supposedly has been abolished in, 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 uh, uh, through the repartimiento uh, in, in Spain, but not in Portugal. Portugal continues the slave trade, so slavery. So you're going to witness um, uh, the Spanish, in theory, had abolished slavery. The Portuguese did not. Now, the Portuguese and the Spanish in 1750 are negotiating and demarcating the border between the colonies of Spain and Portugal. Portuguese Brazil. So in the clip what's going to happen is we're going to see Robert De Niro whereas in the first clip he was a slave raider for the, the Spanish because they were selling slaves to the Portuguese. Robert De Niro has now switched sides. Now he's a missionary. He's, he's part of the church and the reason why he switched sides was if you notice when he was coming into town he saw his wife and, he, and he, he waved to his wife. Well, his wife was having an affair with his brother. And so when he finds out about that in the film, he's going to murder his, his brother. And he's going to seek repentance for that death that now he's going to commit himself and join the Jesuits and offer his life up to a life of servitude under the Lord. So he becomes involved in the spiritual conversion 
of the Guarani. So in the film clip, a cardinal is called out to determine what to do with the missions that were caught in the border dispute. And this is where we're going to go to, to understand uh, the debate. And, but just listen to the debate and recognize, again, in the debate, how they're playing out the fact that Native peoples are not even considered as human beings. And this is the key because um, even though the scene recreates the middle of the 18th century, this debate was formed in Mexico and the Caribbean and upon arrival uh, of, of Columbus and Cortez. Columbus in the Caribbean and Cortez in Mexico. And this has been a debate, well, all the way to today about native populations. So let's go to that film clip. And for the first time, what a strange world I had been sent to judge. Don Cabeza, how can you possibly refer to this child as an animal? Parrot can be taught to sing, Your Eminence. <laughs> ah, yes. But how does one teach you to sing as melodiously as this? Your Eminence. This is a child of the jungle. An animal with a human voice. If it were human, an animal would cringe at its vices. These creatures are lethal and lecherous. They will have to be subdued by the sword and brought to profitable labor by the whip. What they say is sheer nonsense. Your Eminence, Father Gabriel of the Mission of San Carlos, from which the boy comes. And that is where? That is here, Your Eminence, above the falls in Spanish territory. I oh, know, that is territory which used to be Spanish, Father. Now it's Portuguese. Surely that is what His Eminence is here to decide, Your Excellency. No, that is a state matter. It was decided by the Treaty of Madrid and concluded by their Majesties of Spain and Portugal. But surely the missions will still remain under the protection of the Church. Ah, now, that is what His Eminence is here to decide, Father Gabriel. Continue, Father. Your Eminence, below the falls, the jungle, if it has to be divided, may be divided between the Spanish and the Portuguese, as you have agreed. But in reality, above the falls, it still belongs to God and the Guarani. There's no one else there. And they are not naturally animal. They're naturally spiritual. Spiritual? They kill their own young. That is true. May I answer that? Every man and woman is allowed one child. If a third is born, it is immediately killed. But this is not some animal right. It's a necessity for survival. They can only run with one child apiece. And what do they run from? They run from us. That is, they run from slavery. Slavery rubbish. Well known. Rubbish. Your eminence. Slave trade. Your eminence. Rubbish. Rubbish. Your eminence. Your eminence. Your eminence. In the territories covered by Spain, there is no slavery. That institution, however, is permitted in the territories of our excellent neighbors, the Portuguese, and is, to my mind, much misunderstood. But here, here in Spanish territory, we conduct our plantation in strict accordance with the laws of Spain and the precepts of the church. That is a lie. That is a lie. I cannot and will not accept a challenge from a monk. 
His cloth protects him. My but cloth protects name, you, in Senor Cabeza. In the name Cabeza. of the king, whose dignity I represent, I demand an apology. I want an apology now. Damn you, I won't stand for this. Your Eminence, I think we've just seen a good example of Jesuit contempt for the authority of the state. Member of your community, Father Gabriel? Yes. When we understand that even though this scene recreates the middle of the 18th century, this debate was formed in Mexico and in the Caribbean in the early 16th century. And of course it leads to a very important debate about <clears throat> the significance of discovery. Mm -hmm.